Over the past few years, we've been hearing a lot about spiritual abuse and religious trauma. Research shows that up to a third of adults in America have suffered some form of spiritual abuse, and 10 to 20 percent of U.S. adults are currently suffering from spiritual abuse. You might be one of these people, or you likely know someone who's experienced it. And I'm excited to announce that our friends at Broken to Beloved are hosting two brand new events dedicated to addressing this issue. The first one, if you're a pastor or church leader, you're invited to the Broken to Beloved Conference on Thursday, September 26th, where you're going to gain trauma-informed resources for your churches and organizations so you can grow in awareness of how to protect and safeguard your communities and build trustworthy cultures. You'll hear from pastor and author Steve Carter. He was on episode 100, as well as experts Jeff and Sid Holsklaw. And then number two, if you've been hurt or wounded by the church or her leaders, you're invited to a special Broken to Beloved gathering on Friday, September 27th, where you'll gain practical tools and resources to help you move toward healing and wholeness. You're going to hear from our dear friend and therapist, Andy Kolber, who's been a guest on the podcast numerous times. Both of these are going to be incredible events. They're taking place in Richmond, Virginia, and you can find all the information and registration at brokentobeloved.org. Don't miss this opportunity to attend the first Broken to Beloved conference and gathering and join Broken to Beloved in moving toward healing and wholeness together. Go to brokentobeloved.org. We all want to give our kids the very best, and that means finding snacks that taste great and that are also healthy. And that's why I'm so thrilled that Organifi has a whole line of great tasting superfood blends made especially for kids. Try their Organifi Kids Easy Greens. This nourishing and delicious blend of superfoods and veggies is especially crafted to provide essential nutrients, probiotics, and building blocks to support children's growing bodies. Or try Organifi Kids Protect, a delicious berry punch crafted with the purest organic ingredients, offering a potent combination to bolster your child's immune defenses. Organifi is a line of organic superfood blends that offer plant-based nutrition and high-quality ingredients, helping you move from a depleted to nourished state. Head over to www.organifi.com slash best of you and use code best of you for 20% off your entire order. That's www.organifi.com slash best of you. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Allison and I'm so glad you're here to discover what brings out the best of you. This podcast is all about breaking free from painful patterns mending the past and discovering our true selves in God. I can't wait to get started as we learn together how to become the best version of who we are with God's help. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to this week's episode of the Best of You podcast. I'm so glad you're here this week. This is our very last episode in this series, Therapists on therapy. And I've just really enjoyed the conversations in this series, getting to know different therapists, different resources, different areas of expertise. We'll have many more series like this because I love having other therapists on the podcast. But for today's episode, I wanted to introduce you to a dear friend of mine who has a really unique background working as a therapist in church-based settings. So when we think about therapy, we often think about it as an individual endeavor, right? You're struggling. Something's not working in your life. You don't like the way you feel or you're struggling in a relationship. And so you decide to seek the support of a therapist. Now, a typical therapy session, as most of us know, is you go to an office or you log on virtually and you meet one-on-one with your therapist. You have a dedicated space each week devoted to focusing on how to heal a wound or how to effectively cope with a tough situation or how to communicate better to treat anxiety or depression, right? You do all of this in the privacy of that individual relationship. But here's the thing as a therapist I often think about, and that is this. So often as a therapist, we're working with somebody individually, we're equipping them, we're helping them get healthier, we're helping them think differently, we're helping them discover new strategies, new ways to protect themselves, new ways to set boundaries, new ways to understand a situation. But then 
as an individual, you go back into the systems around you. You go back into a family system. You go back into a church system. You go back into a work system. You go back into systems of other people, and you're expected to apply these new skills, but other people don't always respond to the changes within you in ways that are helpful. Sometimes they do. A lot of times they don't. And so often I think about how do we also change the system? How do we also tackle the problems that exist in systems around us? And my guest today, Dr. Monique Gadsen, has worked for decades within systems. She started her work within a church community and now works within an academic institution where she works to bring healing not only to individuals, but to entire Systems. As a consulting therapist, Dr. Monique has worked for decades with churches and organizations in leadership development, risk management, and establishing emotionally and mentally healthy environments. She holds a PhD in marriage and family therapy and two master's degrees in Christian psychological studies and clinician mental health counseling. She hosts the podcast called And the Church Said, where she discusses church and culture from a Christian counseling perspective. And she is an assistant professor of counseling psychology at the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology. Monique has been on the podcast two times before, back in episode 33, where she talked about overcoming people-pleasing and some of her thoughts on depression. And she also appeared with Andy Kolber on episode 60, How to Make New Friends and Identify Red and Green Flags. She is such a wealth of wisdom. I loved this conversation. We just talked so candidly about what it means to heal systems, because the truth is God designed us to exist in communities with other people. And so it's so important to think about not only how do we heal ourselves, but how do we also bring healing to the communities that we're a part of? Please enjoy my conversation with Dr. Monique smith Gadson. Monique, I am just so thrilled to get to have this conversation with you. I get to have lots of conversations with you. So it's really, really fun for me to get to record this conversation with you so that other people can hear it as well. Thank you so much for being here with me today. You know, I love being with you. Your podcast is one of my favorites anyway. So it's just really fun to be able to record for one of my favorite podcasts and one of my favorite people. So thank you. (laughs) One of the things that I think is so interesting about your background, Monique, is you are a therapist, but your work almost from the get-go was within a church context. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that looked like? You really pioneering on the front end, you set up shop as a therapist within a church. How did that happen and, and how did that work? Yeah. (laughs) Not only did I set up shop in a church, but let's, you know, be very specific in context, the Black church over some years ago now, um, when it was not necessarily kind of the trending thing that it somewhat is now. So truly a guy thing, I just always felt called to the Black church specifically, um, growing up as a PK. So Black church has been central, you know, in my life from then until now. And I had just come to understand that there, it felt like there was this void, you know, in the church in terms of us talking about at length mental and emotional struggles that people, people were experiencing. So I, I went to graduate school, trained as a professional clinician, and was talking with my pastor one day about what I had done in graduate school. And before I know it, they are asking me to come and be a part of the staff at the church. And so, yeah, I had the opportunity to just really cultivate what does a counseling ministry slash having a professional clinician on staff looks like in this particular context. Your experience, your expertise is so interesting, having the both end of the individual training, the clinical training, the background, but being within a church context, what do you see as the pros and cons of being situated as a counselor within a church community? I think the pros would be that people, and again, I'm going to speak my social location 
from the years gone by, having to help people to understand that these two do marry well together, counseling and the faith. Historically, when I started out again, there was a lot of skepticism, a lot of, you know, suspicion. <laughs> it felt as though there was this attempt to brainwash. And so I think being housed within a church gave people the opportunity, especially over the context of the numbers of years that I found myself situated there, would give people the opportunity to understand that it does not have to be in direct opposition, you know. Yeah. And that it, it is very much biblical for us to attune to our mental and our emotional needs. And, you know, not to even cast a shade, if you will, on however pastors so choose to present their sermons. But sometimes when the context is just, you know, here is the, the biblical passage and I'm preaching it and perhaps would not hone in on, see, look at this emotional state of this individual or kind of look at how this person's mental health suffered. It may be the tendency to not see that, you know, if it's not focused in on more specifically. So I think that that was a pro of being able to be in that context. I think one of the cons would be having to understand how, um, when we're thinking more systemically, right, how you can have an individual that is situated within a community where sometimes the work that the individual is attempting to do for their own betterment of their emotional and mental health might not be supported in the overall community. And so I think that that was a con at times in spaces, not overall. But there are things I think that we would try to promote in terms of you know, the emotional and mental well-being that I think some people would question from a spiritual perspective. And I know you know, because you talk so often about things, spiritual bypassing, you know, how some things are misinterpreted. And if you had faith, then this would not be. So I think that there are some places where, for me, th those were problematic, where then you'll get the person to come back that would repeat the cliche that they've heard, you know, well, if I'm too blessed to be stressed, then why am I feeling this way? And I'm thinking... <laughs> okay. So in that respect, having to think about the environment that we're going to send people back into. Okay. So let's talk about this for a second, because this is this dichotomy that really happens on every level. So we have therapy. You go in, you're getting healing resources for your individual healing, but then you have these systems. And a system could be a church. It could be a family. It could be an institution. It could be a place of work. It could be, you know, a system is just a group of people. We need to be parts of systems. We don't exist in isolation. So inevitably, you go back into a system. And if the messages within the system are not supporting or reinforcing what you're learning in therapy, it creates dissonance for the person, also for the therapist at times. I'm always working to stay hydrated. My family teases me because I always have some form of hydration nearby or in my hand. And having safe, clean water is the last thing I want to worry about. And that's why you've got to check out AquaTrue. AquaTrue purifiers use a four-stage reverse osmosis purification process. And their countertop purifiers work with no installation or plumbing. They remove 15 times more contaminants than ordinary pitcher filters and are specifically designed to combat chemicals like PFAs in our water supply. Best of all, the water tastes fantastic. It's portable, making it perfect for renters or college dorms. And the filters are affordable and long lasting. I never worry about drinking tap water anymore. I know my tap water is not just filtered with AquaTrue, it's purified. AquaTrue comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee and even makes a great gift. Today, my listeners receive 20% off any AquaTrue purifier. Just go to AquaTrue.com, that's A-Q-U-A-T-R-U.com, and enter code BEST OF YOU at checkout. That's 20% off any AquaTrue water purifier when you go to AquaTrue.com and use promo code B-E-S-T-O-F-Y-O-U. Americans spend an average of 90% of their time indoors and take about 20,000 breaths a day. 
The indoor air that we breathe is two to five times more polluted than outdoor air, and in some cases, up to 100 times more polluted, according to the EPA. So what's the solution? Introducing an air purifier that captured the attention of established media outlets such as CNN, Money, ABC, and more. Air Doctor filters out 99% of dangerous contaminants so your lungs don't have to. This includes pollutants such as allergens, pollen, pet dander, dust mites, mold spores, and even bacteria and viruses that make you sick. Air Doctor comes with a 30-day Breathe Easy money-back guarantee. So if you don't love it, just send it back for a refund minus shipping. Head to airdoctorpro.com and use promo code BEST OF YOU. You'll receive up to $300 off air purifiers. Exclusive to podcast customers, you will also receive a free three year warranty on any unit, which is an additional $84 value. Lock this special offer by going to airdoctorpro.com. That's A I R D O C T O R P R O.com and use promo code BEST OF YOU. I'm going to admit it, I love getting fresh groceries delivered right to my door. It's just so convenient. And Thrive Market is the number one destination for parents looking for healthy, stress-free grocery shopping for the whole family, especially as we start to enter into the busy back-to-school season. From nut-free snacks to high-protein bars and snack packs for lunch boxes, Thrive Market has you and your kids covered as you get back into the school year and your routine. You'll find all kinds of healthy the snack brands like Simple Mills, Annie's, and our favorite, that's it, fruit bars. And I love that Thrive Market only allows trusted top quality ingredients while restricting thousands of harmful ingredients like artificial flavors, high fructose corn syrup, and more. Best of all, when you join Thrive Market, you are also helping a family in need with their one-for-one membership matching program. Save time and money and shop Thrive Market today. Go to thrivemarket.com slash best of you for 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift. That's T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash best of you. Thrivemarket.com slash best of you. So let's talk about it on two levels. Number one, for the individual, you're experiencing this dissonance. I'm hearing one thing over here from my therapist, but then I'm at church and they're saying something else. And I see what you're saying. That could be really magnified if your counselor's literally within your church setting and they're not totally aligned. And so I guess I'm curious, as a therapist, it seems to me that when you're within that context, you're both thinking of your individual clients, but you're also thinking about how do I help this system be a safer place for folks who are hurting? A lot of the work I felt included, how do I impact the system? And I think it would look simply, for an example, in our own grief support groups, people are coming They find themselves like, oh, here I am now on this grief journey. And so I would talk to the participants quite often about how so many times we find ourselves in the middle of a grief journey, not only as a participant, but also as an educator. And so we're having to say to people sometimes, that's not helpful (laughs) when you say whatever it is that you say. So especially in the case of, say, a person experienced miscarriage. And I'll just stop there because there are are so many different scenarios. I know this one more so even personally as well as professionally, right? People would say something might have been wrong with the baby. And so that was God's way of protecting you. Or, you know, and you're thinking, what in the world does this even mean? You know, so you would hear those types of comments. And we would actually talk about that sometimes in the support groups where we are saying these things land in ways that are so not helpful. (laughs) And how is it that then we need to think about how it is impacting us and to empower ourselves to say to other people why that is not helpful and perhaps even what would be a better thing to say or not to say, you know, in those moments. That's just one example of ways that we are thinking of you can impact the system. And we know from thinking about just, you know, systems in nature that one person enters, one person exits, the system changes, right? So if we can get a person to enter that system who is better educated, better informed, then we are looking to impact change even in that way. It's so interesting to think about a support group, which is a system, 
within a larger church context, because there, there's something really cool about what you're saying that the overall system, the church system, isn't going to be perfect. It's like a giant family. People are going to say things that rub you the wrong way. The pastor's going to say things that you don't even agree with or that hurt. We don't expect a family to be perfect. We don't expect a church family to be perfect. There's toxicity. There's toxic cultures, and that's one thing. But then there's just imperfect human gatherings of people, which is every single church on this planet, right? And so we're talking about that category in this moment. But what's interesting about what you're saying is when you have a support group or a counselor within that context, there's a way in which I could see where it'd be harder, but there's also a way in which suddenly you've gone through something really hard. You've lost a family member people are saying things that aren't helpful to you within the church family, but you've got this other subgroup within the family where you can process that, where you can get support, where people do get you, where you might even feel buoyed up to to go back out into their larger family and say, hey, that's not helpful because you're not alone. And so there's a way in which that subsystem kind of creates more health within the larger system. That's like a, a large extended family where there's different pockets within the family of varying degrees of safety. I think that's a beautiful way that you even describe it. The hope is, and, I, and even as you were talking, I guess I was thinking about allergy shots. <laughs> Probably because I'm soon faced to have to take them. But anyway, when you think about even the concept, right, of the allergy shot, like you are being injected with these things that you are allergic to, that is supposed to build your system up over time to calm it. You know, that it's like, oh, okay, I don't have to blow up every time this particular foreign substance, if you will, kind of enters into my system. And so I think about it when we can get whomever the individual or individuals will be injected with something that, like you're saying, is not necessarily the toxic system, right? But if it's, okay, helping people to understand how to better support a person, you know, to, to really understand that everything does not necessarily have a spiritual response to it or needs even a spiritual response to it. it doesn't have to be spiritualized away. When we can get um, a few individuals who understand that and who can demonstrate that, you know, with another individual, then that is a way that we can begin that process of trying to create the environment, the larger system, to become more healthy and more thoughtful, even, I would say, in particular situations. That's incredible, Monique. It feels to me like the trajectory of your body of work, even what you're doing now at a graduate school setting where you from the inside of an organization, you're trying to introduce or expose some of these micro toxins, these micro things that hurt just little by little through that creating a healthier system. That's hard work. But when you're embedded within that system as a therapist, where you're really trying to go in and help that individual, but you're simultaneously aware of how the system is creating harm, even at the best of circumstances, that's a lot. It's a lot. It's a two-front battle. How do you sustain your own spiritual and emotional health through that? Talk to people like you. <laughs> um, you're grateful for people who, who get it, who understand that I have that opportunity to go and say that this is hard. And I don't know that people necessarily get it. And um, it is fatiguing. And it is hard when you enter into a system, you understand the need to differentiate who you are, even within that system. You know, many, many years ago, of course, then I was a whole lot younger. <laughs> I was, you know, younger, younger as a clinician. So over the years, I've, I've you know, thankfully gathered more experience, more wisdom. But you do understand that you have to have a sense of like, who are you? Yeah. As it relates to this particular system. And in as much as you can, how is it that you think about impacting the change without being kind of lured into that homeostasis 
that the system is going to want to maintain. So back when I said a minute ago, anytime someone new enters or exits, the system changes, right? And so it's like, okay, things are a little bonkers right now. And all pieces of the system usually are going to operate in such a way to bring that balance and that calm, if you will, back, right? Whatever that norm is for that particular system, that is what they're wanting to bring back into um, existence. So when you enter into a system and when you are trying to bring about change and when you are having to name things, when you're having to call out, identify the factors that create anxiety (laughs) within the system, of course, that is going to cause the system to become anxious, right? And so when that happens, then whatever that looks like in terms for the system to say, hey, you are the foreign particle. Yeah. Yeah. And therefore, how is it that we can deal with you so that our anxiety can ease? And because that's going to be the nature of the system, the person such as myself who has to embed in the system while also trying to bring about a level of change within that system, we have to be so very mindful that things that come to us are about us and also are not about us. Have to understand that it's survival anxiety (laughs) that is being stirred within a system. And they, meaning their system, looks at that particular entity as something or someone that needs to be annihilated, if you will to be able to bring the system back to a level of calm. So I have to be mindful. This is why we have to enter into systems knowing what is the assignment. And I've said this several times over the years in the various systems that I have found myself. A lot of prayer. A lot of journaling, you know, journaling is like my thing. I I prescribe it anytime and everywhere I can. But for me, those are the tools that I definitely have to rely on uh, praying and journaling and being in community with people who understand. I am being adversely impacted working within those systems to be able to be reminded of this is my assignment. Go in, do your assignment, step out when you need to, take the break, take a rest, dust off your equipment, put it back on, and get back at it. That, for me, is how I usually have to approach it. I think about David in the scripture, and I remember reading this not too long ago, and actually journaled quite a bit about it, even when he was going to battle Goliath. And Saul tried to put on David his his armor. Right. And David was like, this isn't working for me. And so he took it off and he goes and he chooses his slingshot and the stones. Right. So he's like, this is me. (laughs) This is what I need to be able to do this assignment that I feel like the Lord has sent me to do. So I think we have to be very mindful, again, of, you know, a a sense of who we are, especially in the Lord, and what is it that He has called us to do, to be able to get in there and to do. You're not going to go in and not be unscathed whatsoever. Like, it's just no way. But we do have to have an understanding of our assignment so that we are able to stay focused on the task at hand. (laughs) This is why I wanted to have you on. This is what I love about you because this work that you're doing so faithfully to disrupt, distress, kind of introduce anxiety, to your point, into a a system in order to change the system so the system will be healthier for the individuals it tries to serve which is the goal, right? And and for the listener, we're not even talking about completely toxic systems. We're really talking about, for the most part, healthy but broken human systems. And this is what is so, I think, nuanced about change 
I, I think about the listener who's at a church where they're like, you know, I love this church. It's not toxic. And by that, by toxic, I think when you're someone like you who's going in and you're disrupting and you're naming things and you're calling out things and you're saying, hey, I don't think this is quite right. You're getting pushback. It's hard. It's not fun, but you're also not getting gaslit. You're not getting shut down. You're not getting exiled. That would be toxic. That would be abusive. And it would be untenable. Sometimes it's it's a fine line. <laughs> but for the most part, it's like the system is, has invited my voice in. They want to hear from me. They're listening. There is enough of a relational trust. This is why I wanted to try to have this conversation. It's a hard conversation to have because we're talking about that messy middle where it's not this, you got to get out because this is toxic And it's also not this, I just love everything about this community. It's meeting all of my needs. It's that murky middle of there's some good, but there's some things that are hard, which is so much of so many of our experiences. And this is what you do. You go in (laughs) to that kind of place and try to introduce change, just one brave step at a time, like David with his slingshot. And I think it's so profound, Monique what you do. And I think for the listener, whether you're a therapist or not, when you show up, to your point, when you show up in a system and you name things and you call out things and you you get in, it's not always instantly gratifying, but it is that good, hard work of bringing change. But there is a cost to it. There is a high cost, <laughs> for sure. And I think even back to what you were saying, it's not always necessarily toxic slash abusive, but it can be, like you say, such a fine line (laughs) that I am saying, ooh, do you even understand how close you are tethering to (laughs) it potentially being toxic and abusive, if you will, because (laughs) when you're talking about this messy middle, I think one of the hardest concepts (laughs) for me to get people to understand is kind. Okay, I have said I would appreciate you being kind, yes, versus what could be the other side of that coin, maybe rude. (laughs) Of course, I would prefer you to be kind. And also, I am saying when it comes to sometimes having to enact change or a change, kindness doesn't cut it. Kindness can be a scapegoat, if you will, for transformation taking place. Because that transformation is going to call upon us to be uncomfortable. You know, it's going to call for us to have to look at self in the mirror in ways that more than likely will uptick the anxiety, right? But if we don't have the threshold to deal with that, then we might resort back to let's be kind and be nice to people and we'll be hospitable. We'll open up a space for you to come in, which hear me say, I'm not minimizing that, but we're talking about what might be needed, which will include a transformation to take place, which is going to require as you're saying, that messy middle. Like, we just don't get to do that without being touched in some ways and touched in ways that, again, probably will increase our anxiety. Yeah, it's not always comfortable. And kind, to your point, can mask kind of this false peace as opposed to, oh, I don't like that. I don't really like what she's saying. Which, again, the more honest and sincere might be, I don't know if there's anything I can do about it. I don't like it. It's hard to sit with. It's uncomfortable. And just sitting with that, which as clinicians, we're sort of trained to sit with that. But a lot of folks aren't. And that's how change occurs in any kind of system, in a family, in a church, is sitting with, oh, I don't like what you're saying. I like you. I don't like what you're saying. 
This might not have even been what I really wanted. When I asked for your input, you're actually giving me real input. Let me sit with that. Let me sit with that discomfort. Whether it's a family. I mean, if it's the parent having to say the hard thing to the kid. (laughs) Or, yes, in this day and time, yes, you know, young adults are reflecting back and maybe parents were not perfect again. Not necessarily saying toxic, abusive. That's a totally different context. And yes, it requires, I say, a different kind of approach. But yeah, there are sometimes as parents, we need to hear from children like, okay, oh, wow, I didn't realize the way I said it or the way I was, you know, was that problematic, you know, whatever the case, it, it causes a discomfort. You know, it's that the mirror has been held into your face and you're like, Whoo, okay, don't like what I see there. But it is apparent that that needs to change. So in that family system, yes, you know, that can happen. In the church setting, having to even be mindful that even when we think about in Revelation, you know, the letter to the churches, and I'm thinking about the church of Laodicea, and, you know, the word says that if you're not hot, if you're not cold, if you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out, right? (laughs) So there is something about saying either you're for the Word of God, or you're like, you're not. I mean, that's really the way it is, right? But to hear things being proclaimed in a church setting, whether, you know, we personally might agree or not, but if it's lining up with what the Word of God says, it may make us uncomfortable. But that's how this transformation is going to, you know, to take place. If it's an institution, if we're saying we're trying to be a thing, or we're wanting to be more welcoming or more diverse or more whatever the case may be, okay, well, the reality of how that might have to happen versus the ideal, you're going to have to spend some time, as you're saying, in that messy middle. And we're in this time in our culture where we are so conditioned to quick fixes, so much so that we don't have, again, this threshold to say, you're right, and it might require more than some bandaging to make it appear to be what we in reality says that it needs to be. Yeah, we want the quick fix. We want the, we did it. Look, we checked all the boxes. We're now a healthy culture. We're healthy. Or our folks are just tearing the whole thing down. I'm out. And sometimes that's needed. But change, so much of change. I. This is a little bit of a tangent, but I actually heard Trevor Noah say this on a podcast recently. I thought it was really interesting. He was talking to Adam Grant, and they were talking about groupthink in religious cultures. And Trevor Noah was saying when he grew up, his mom faithful believer. they very religious. They went to church all the time. And what Trevor Noah was saying was that the paradox of his mom was she was very loyal, very devout, deeply held beliefs, and she constantly disagreed with their pastor. And so as a kid, he said they would leave church and, you know, his mom would always make him go, always be fully engaged. But on the way home, she'd pick apart the sermon. I didn't agree with him on that. I didn't agree with him on that. I don't think that's right. And so as a kid, he kind of learned this, what we call cognitive complexity. You can hold a couple of different things, which to me, I was listening to it going, that's a tiny little thing where someone from within is still, to your point that you said a a little bit back, is still retaining some individuality, some differentiation. I'm a differentiated person within this setting that I also love. And that's, again, a very nuanced, I think so many of us think, well, if I'm part of this institution, I have to be sold to everything that they say, or I have to be out. And you and I have had this conversation. What does it mean to be within? And, And, you know, it's funny, Monique, we talk about this biblically. You said this to me recently, be in the world, but not of the world. And we think about that primarily in the context of secular cultures, right? Be in in it, but not of it. But the truth is, it also can apply to our faith communities. Be in it, but not completely subsumed by. Keep your own presence of mind. Keep your own discernment. Keep your own cognitive complexity. Disagree. Agree to disagree on some topics. And I think that's what you're trying to do in this very subversive, subtle way within contexts 
is encourage that we're all in with Jesus. We're not all in with a gathering of imperfect humans necessarily. We don't leave our individuality at the door. We don't. And when you talked back about the tearing down, and yes, I do believe that there is a season, and, and Scripture even speaks to there is a time to tear down. And there's also a time to build up. And I think that that's what we kind of fail to move to or toward. <laughs> you know, it's like, turn it down. Okay, but what is it supposed to build back up into? Now, if we're trying to build it back into, whereas you're saying, I can be of it and in it, and it's all like me, and I am all like it, then that's problematic. <laughs> that's just never going to be. I mean, you know, because the diversity of... The way that we're created, God did not even intend for that to be the case. So we have the hard work that we are facing today is, yes, how do we learn to differentiate? How do I look at you and say, you're going to have a different opinion than I have? And it does not mean that your difference of opinion is going to equate to my annihilation. Because I think that that's where we, we jump to kind of automatically. And, and then hear me say this, there has been a lot of stuff <laughs> that has happened in the last, I don't even want to know what number to put on the years, but in the last couple of years, it's a lot. And so we are in very polarized times, right? And I would say that we are all, as a collective, dealing with a post-traumatic something. And I would say it's beyond the pandemic. I think the pandemic gets scapegoated <laughs> into it. I think it it was large enough of an event in our lives, so I'm definitely not minimizing it. But I would also probably make, it, make an argument that there was a lot that existed prior to this pandemic that would now factor into some of this post-traumatic whatever it is that we are experiencing, right? So when, when we have been conditioned, um, when we are hearing rhetoric that will give us the idea that if not for this or for this group of people or this thing, then this would be the outcome. So we're pitted right? We're going to be pitted against one another. And things have been flattened to the point that it's an either and it's an or in our minds. No messy metal. It's an either, it's an or. So that in and of itself is going to, I would argue, it is going to create a survival anxiety because nothing really can be watered down to that. But we're trying to make it fit, and it's not steady. So then we are beset with this survival anxiety. I observe it in families. <laughs> I observe it in classrooms. I observe it in church even. I observe it in institutions. And so now then when we think about what we do from a clinical perspective, we understand that now the bodies are activated and triggered. And so now we, the body, is now in survival mode. When we're there, we already know that all of our rationalizing has gone offline, right? And so we're in fight, flight, survival, freeze, fawning, all of those. Which how do you find your way navigating differences, navigating healthy differentiation within a community context requires that groundedness, that calm nervous system, that ability to hold nuance, right? That individual work that we've been doing, but we now have to bring into these community spaces because we need them. Our dogs love Sundays. I'm not kidding. One of our dogs was the slowest eater on earth for the first several years of her life. It was painful how long it would take her to eat. The minute we introduced her to Sundays, she just 
laps it up. She loves it. Sundays is healthy dog food that's easy to store and serve. Most foods are one or the other, but Sundays is both. It's fresh dog food made from a short list of human grade ingredients that contains 90% meat, 10% superfoods, and 0% synthetic nutrients. But unlike other fresh dog food, it doesn't require refrigeration or preparation. It's air dried, so you simply pour and serve. It's so easy. Get 40% off your first order of Sundays. Go to sundaysfordogs.com slash best of you or use code best of you at checkout. I try so hard to create a sanctuary within my home for me and for my family where every evening it's a refuge from the demands of the outside world and all the noise and chaos of our lives. And that's one of the things I love about Cozy Earth. They understand how to help you transform your space into an elevated haven that brings comfort and tranquility in the midst of our hectic lives. I love Cozy Earth's bamboo sheet sets. They're made from 100% premium viscose from bamboo, and they are so soft, and they only get softer with every wash, and they even come with a 10-year warranty. That's how durable they are. Go to CozyEarth.com slash Best of You and use code Best of You for an exclusive 40% discount. And if you get a post-purchase survey, say that you heard about Cozy Earth from the Best of You podcast, and they'll send you a free set of socks. Upgrade your nights and transform your days with Cozy Earth. Go to CozyEarth.com slash Best of You and use code Best of You for an exclusive 40% discount. I really agree with you. I think culturally we're seeing this It's on so many levels. You even think about it, it's just easy. You know, I'll just go to therapy and not go to church because I'll get my needs met. I'll, I experience love and attunement, um, but I don't have to deal with all the stuff you and I are talking about, you know, and and yet we need to figure out how to find our place within a group of people. We do, you know, that's part of our design, but it does require that that internal strength, that internal calm. I think you're right. I think we are in need of a, a new way of thinking about how to be together. I mean, I think where we're really getting at here is this, how do we be a collective of individuals, which includes differing beliefs, differing cultural experiences. You and I talk about this. We've had very different, you've had different experiences in a black church than I've had in more white dominant churches. And yet sometimes when you and I talk, there's more overlap than difference. There's differences in doctrinal issues, right? There's differences where we come down and how we view scripture, how we view this, how we view that. There's differences in personalities and styles, right? And all of those things matter, But the reality is it's messy to figure out how to come together in a group, honoring these differences on different levels, honoring our individual identities, our individual personhood, our individual beliefs, while simultaneously creating a group, creating a whole. I'm not sure we've scratched the surface of how to do that. With that sort of backdrop, I'm curious, what brings you hope? What brings me hope? (laughs) is, so even as you were talking, maybe I could kind of connect those two. Because as you talk about us as individuals living in this diversified world, where more than likely there are going to be more people that do not look like us, think like us, you know, vote like us, or talk like us, or dress like us, or whatever the case may be, eat like us. I mean, just fill in the blank, right? But when we understand that we can create a microcosm that can eventually impact the macrocosm, that is what gives me hope. So being around, okay, like, you know, we talk about, we have these conversations, right? And we have conversations, the two of us, and we have conversations with other people. And to be able to experience that as a microcosm gives me hope that if when we are done talking and these individuals go and live their lives according to how we did in that group, that gives me hope. Because if I don't see, and I say this to students, if we don't see or if we ourselves are not injecting into society 
what we need to see, not what we want to see, because sometimes we can be skewed by our own wants, but what we need to see, even when we think more scripturally, you know, in terms of loving neighbor, in terms of understanding that every individual that has breath is an image bearer of God himself. If we're not injecting that into society, then I would truly be hopeless. But to be able to experience it and to know that there are individuals who are going out into other systems and I'm praying and believing that they are impacting those systems in ways that the system may not, you know, when I say like it, meaning like, no, you're shaking things up and we don't want to be shaken up. We want to be as we are. Then I have hope. I love that. That could be the whole theme of this episode for the listener. Go out and be that image bearer and bring goodness and honesty and authenticity into whatever space you're going into. That is how you will begin to change that system. Tell me, Monique, as we wind down here, these are two questions I like to ask all my guests. What would you say to that, you know, 20-something-year-old younger you that was starting a counseling practice in the midst of a church, what would you say to her now? I think I would say to her now, you were on assignment and you were on task. You were on task. I think when you don't have a blueprint, if you will, to follow, and when you really are having to follow what you pray is the leading of the the Holy Spirit, and when you have others or very few who are in agreement or who are, again, kind of pushing against or pushing back, you can doubt what you're doing. But when you have the opportunity to have many, many years behind you and to be able to reflect back and to know that you were on assignment and you were on task, I think that's what I would tell her. That's beautiful. What's bringing out the best of you right now? Whew, what is bringing out the best in me right now? I think, <laughs> to be honest, the hard stuff, the things that it would be easier, again, to just bypass, stage of life, stage of spiritual growth, understanding of the complexity of the diversity of the world. Bringing out the best in me includes having to go deeper into that messy middle. I love that. You are an absolute gem. I honor the decades of work you have put into changing cultures, changing systems, whether in the Black church, whether now in a more predominantly white institution. I mean, you go in, you take the assignment, and you live it. And I just could not be more grateful for who you are and for how you have honored that assignment that God has given you. You are beloved. You are welcome here anytime we want to learn from your wisdom. Where can my listeners find your work who want to connect with you and learn more? Yeah, so I play around on Instagram at times. <laughs> I think at Dr. Monique Smith Gatson. So that's the Instagram handle there. And website would be the same, Dr. Monique Smith Gatson.com. You've got a podcast called And the Church Says, and there's some great episodes on it for folks who want to listen to you. You've got some great conversations in there. Go back and hear that. Thank you so much for giving us your time and your wisdom today. I'm so grateful for you. Thank you for having me, Allison. Thank you for joining me for this week's episode of The Best of You. It would mean so much if you'd take a moment to subscribe. You can go to Apple, Spotify, Amazon Music, or wherever you listen to podcasts and click the plus or follow button. That will ensure you don't miss an episode and it helps get the word out to others. While you're there, I'd love it if you leave your five-star review. I look forward to seeing you back here next Thursday. And remember, as you become the best of who you are, you honor God, you heal others, and you stay true to your God-given self.